At the same time King Philip's War was taking place in New England, down in Virginia there were other issues arising. Now, we're talking about the 1670s, mid-1670s. So by that point, the Jamestown colony, which had grown into the larger Virginia colony, was almost 70 years old. From the beginning, a lot of the uh, labor, most of the labor, was done by indentured servants, right? People from England who had signed those contracts with the understanding that they would come over and do the work and that uh, when their contracts expired, they would then have their freedom and have access to land. Well, there were, uh, there were a couple problems with that for those indentured servants. First problem was that most of them didn't live to the end of their contract, which again could be anywhere from five to seven or eight years. So in those early decades of the Virginia colony, uh, between starvation and disease and wars with the Powhatan Indians, a large number of uh, those indentured servants, most of them in fact, just didn't make it. Now another factor was that <clears throat> those people who had bought their labor, who had signed the other side of that contract, who got their work, knew that they only had them for a limited amount of time. That when those seven years were up, then that service was up and they'd have to get somebody else. So um, the employers really, in, in many cases, in trying to maximize the benefits from uh, the indentured servants and trying to get the most out of them as possible, didn't put a whole lot into them. They didn't invest a whole lot in uh, food and medicine, and they worked them sometimes literally to death to squeeze every last drop of benefit from them. So in those early decades of Virginia, the early to the mid-1600s, the, uh, the number of indentured servants who made it through to their indenture and got to be in a position then to own their own labor, as John Smith had promised, and to look for land, were few and far between. Now, this had started to change by the late 1600s as the colony became more and more settled as they got the hang of the local agriculture and feeding themselves essentially. And after the end of that uh, uh, Powhatan War in the 1630s when they sort of leveraged, the English that is, leveraged their, uh, their power in the region and defeated more and more tribes, then there were uh, there were fewer Indian wars and fights. So all that put together led to an increasing number of indentured servants actually reaching the end of their contract. And the problem they faced then <clears throat> was that uh, when they went out to claim land, it had all been claimed already in the meantime, during those decades when most indentured servants weren't making it. So the good land had all been claimed really by the more well-to-do people. So uh, there was very little land to be had. What little land was available was the land that no one else wanted, which was usually higher up in the mountains to the west, uh, which is uh, you know, more difficult uh, to produce large crops, uh, particularly of the things that they were, they were growing, and closer to those uh, Indian tribes who were still autonomous. Um, so odds are you're not going to get any land at all. If you get any, it's going to be up in the mountains right next to the, uh, the Indians. So uh, by the 16, uh, 1670s, the situation had developed uh, in such a way that the Virginia colony was kind of becoming similar to England a hundred years earlier when there had been that population 
shift that had led to the English crown financing these ventures to get more colonies to send those landless, unemployed, poor white people to. Well, they sent them there and they uh, ended their, their work contract and now they are landless, unemployed, and disaffected and there are more of them every year as more and more of those indentured servants reach the end of their contracts. So you've got this whole whole class of unemployed, landless, poor people who are kind of ticked off because the whole promise had been they are going to be able to get land. Well, what was stopping them? Uh, the, uh, the availability of land. Now, there were still several tribes uh, that were uh, in existence in the area. Some had been uh, pushed uh, farther to the west. Some had been decimated by wars and disease. But there were still quite a few left. Um, the, the royal colony, the, uh, the royal government of the colony, did not want to be in perpetual warfare with the local Indians. The local Indians that were left were the ones that had sided with the English, that had been their allies, and that they hoped would still be their allies if there were problems with the French or the Spanish. Also, they were the tribes with whom the uh, uh, authorities, the colonial authorities, wanted to be able to trade. Therefore, it was not in the best interests of the colony or of the crown to kill all the Indians. However, those uh, unemployed poor people started agitating for that to be done. Uh, all the Indians, no matter whose side they had been on, no matter whether they were good trade partners or not, um, more and more of this, uh, um, this class, this working class that were largely out of work, wanted those Indians removed from that land to make more land available for them and people like them, which again is the reason that they came over. That's the promise that had been made to them. Uh, they weren't getting anywhere with those demands because the, uh, well, Parliament, uh, the Crown, even the uh, royal authorities of the colony had a big picture view, right? Um, there was, by this point, late 1600s, a lot of possessions that England had around the world, and it all had to be kind of kept in balance. Resources had to be allocated appropriately, and they just didn't want to always be at war with the Indians. And in the middle of all this, in the middle of all of this, a very charismatic individual came along named Nathaniel Bacon. Nathaniel Bacon was not an indentured servant, nor was he working class. He was actually uh, from a very well-to-do family in England, and he wound up moving to the Virginia colony in part because uh, he had gotten into so many uh, uh, troubles uh, back in England. His family had sent him to the uh, sent him to the colonies, and he uh, had the opinion, that because he was from such a prominent family, that he was going to get to Virginia and immediately uh, given a job at the top of the government, which didn't happen. Now, part of the reason that didn't happen was, as charismatic as he could be with crowds on an individual one-on-one -on -one level, he was kind of an a-hole and nobody liked him much. He was very uh, arrogant and very presumptuous, the governor of the colony really couldn't stand him, wasn't going to be giving him any plum assignments or jobs. And with this going on, Bacon sort of uh, joined in with the, uh, the poor people there along the frontier who felt like they had been basically cheated. They hadn't been given what they had been promised, an opportunity to advance. Well, even though he's rich, he felt the same way, right? He thought he was coming here, he was going to get this uh, uh, opportunity, and, and these advancements hadn't come through the way he wanted. So he identified with uh, those uh, former indentured servants and became their spokesperson 
as they were carrying these arguments to the royal governor. Dear sir, kill these Indians because we want their land. And things just kept getting more and more tense at one point in a letter to the uh, royal governor. Bacon wrote uh, to the governor, you care more about, quote, your dear and protected Indians, end quote, than about your own people. And eventually, 1676, this erupted into a full-scale, all-out rebellion, an uprising of colonists against the colonial government. And by colonists, I mean primarily those uh, poor colonists, uh, led by, again, Bacon, who was not a poor colonist. The uh, former indentured servants were joined in this rebellion by a lot of free black colonists. Now, how did you wind up with free black colonists? They had started importing slaves into the Virginia colony in 1619, and in the early years uh, in the early years, the English, who had had no previous experience with the slave trade, treated those slaves kind of like indentured servants, and after so many years, would set them free. And this had been happening, and so there had also been this growing class of, of free blacks in Virginia. So uh, they also uh, were, were farmers, they also wanted their own land. So they joined in with uh, the poor white guys, the poor black guys, poor white guys. Also, a lot of slaves still in slavery ran away uh, from the uh, owners of the tobacco plantations where they worked, and they joined this rebel army. So in essence, so what you wind up with is, is in many ways just kind of like the ultimate American story. Uh, class warfare uh, that involves a bunch of uh, poor white people and a bunch of poor black people uh, joining together to stick it to the man, but mainly because they want to kill Indians and take their land. Uh, of course, the colonial government uh, uh, did not accede to this, and it, it, it led to actual, actual warfare, uh, which dragged on uh, for a while, and uh, the uh, the rebels led by uh, led by Bacon did uh, perhaps better than you would expect. They at one point they seized the capital of Jamestown and burned it to the ground, and the royal governor managed to uh, make his way to a ship and escape. But he was uh, floating on his ship in the harbor, watching his his capital city burn. Uh, eventually. Eventually, the revolution kind of, uh, kind of petered out when they lost their leadership. And that happened when Nathaniel Bacon uh, contracted what was uh, called at the time the bloody flux uh, or dysentery, bloody diarrhea. Uh, and oddly enough, uh, he got it in the swamps, leading a bunch of, of rebels to try to find some Indians to kill. Uh, the Indians had very wisely, when all this started happening, withdrawn into the swamps, which they knew really well. So Bacon and his men are just like sloshing around uh, after they burned down Jamestown, trying to find some more Indians to kill. And, and he contracted a fever and uh, died of bloody diarrhea. So I like to say that Nathaniel Bacon was unable to survive his own movement in more ways than one. Um... So the fighting still continued a little bit after that. In fact, the last hundred or so rebels that were finally decisively defeated, ending the whole thing, uh, more than half of them were of African descent. So in some ways, it is this early cooperation of working class people in colonial America, poor whites and poor blacks working together trying to overthrow the status quo. But then again, you have to factor in, they were wanting to kill, uh, kill Indians and, and take their land. So all this led to, uh, um, well, led to a couple of things, really. Now, uh, I want to stop for a moment and point out that uh, Bacon's Rebellion 
which is something that you may have heard of before. The average person on the street, you might go through several average persons on the street till you found anyone who ha who had even heard of Bacon's Rebellion. And when you did, you might go through several more average persons before you found someone who knew anything about it. It maybe got mentioned in your middle school textbook for half a paragraph. But uh, the reality is, and this is my opinion as a historian, but it's the opinion of most American historians. Bacon's Rebellion was one of the most important events in American history. In fact, I would put it in the top five most important events in American history um, because of its impact, because of the repercussions of, of what happened. And those repercussions were almost immediate. Now, again, you had this situation where poor white farmers and poor free black farmers as well as slaves worked together they cooperated together to overthrow the powers that be and they almost succeeded even if they had succeeded you know the whole british army would have shown up but still they came pretty close they disrupted things quite a bit and the powers that be uh, didn't like that. That's bad. That's bad for the economy. That's bad for particularly the economy where it concerns the plantation owners, uh, the elites, the financial elites and the political elites who tended to be the same people. Uh, they didn't want that sort of thing happening anymore. And they immediately started taking steps to prevent it from happening in the future. And those steps included passing increasingly harsher laws about slavery, uh, including, uh, now already before this, but not too long before this, uh, the courts in Virginia had concluded that slavery is permanent uh, and it doesn't end after a certain amount of time, but other laws were passed uh, making slavery hereditary so that the children of a female slave were born as slaves. Um, also really strict laws about the behavior of slaves, what would be allowed and what would not be, and the behavior of free blacks who before this had had no restrictions on their behavior. If they were not a slave, and they were black, they essentially had the same rights as anybody else. Uh, that is coming to an end in the 1670s with these laws. Also laws that uh, uh, banned interracial marriage. Uh, all, all efforts to drive a wedge between the poor white workers and the poor black workers to keep them from ever coming together again in the way they had done on that occasion. So uh, the reason that I say, and so many people say that this was extremely important, this was the birth of race, really, in America. It was the uh, sort of the forebear of segregation and all the other racial laws designed to, uh, to sow discord among the laboring classes. And Native Americans were going to be involved in this as well. Uh, efforts were made to keep them from cooperating with uh, uh, slaves, escaped slaves, free blacks, and so forth. So uh, bear that, bear that in mind. Anytime you think about uh, uh, race, race relations in America, this was really well, the real starting point was 1619 with the arrival of those first slaves. But 1676, Bacon's Rebellion, that was a huge moment. And it was also a huge moment in the development of, the further development of the idea of westward expansion. Because what was this all about? It was all about the fact that those colonists wanted to kill more Indians because the Indians had the land and they wanted the land. And so uh, they are pushing their government 
to uh, basically sanction those those actions so they can continue expanding westward so like i said i mean this is kind of like the ultimate american story and it is kind of like the uh the really first solidified expression of those theories of frederick jackson turner that we talked about earlier that the essence of being american uh, was moving westward and taking land of course you got to take it away from somebody so as long as you can move westward and get land then you have the opportunity to improve your lot in life to improve your social standing opportunities that for you know well for a long 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 time for centuries had not been available in england or other european countries so 1676 bacon's rebellion in virginia let's go back up north again and take uh, another quick look king philip's war uh 1676-77 in the new england colonies and here you can see the new england colonies now if you're an english colonist living in new england where would the western frontier be for you why it would be right here in new york Yes, New York was the western frontier, although um, earlier in the century it had been known not as New York but as New Amsterdam. It was originally a Dutch colony until the English chased the Dutch away and took it over in 1664. However, when the Dutch were there, they had established uh, a trade relationship with the most powerful uh, tribes in that region, uh, the Mid-Atlantic states, uh, well, Mid-Atlantic colonies, New York. And that was uh, the, uh, the Confederacy or the League of the Iroquois. And again, I'm using the English uh, pronunciation of that. It would actually be Iroquois, which is French. Uh, but you know, we're going to be American. Uh, and as I think I've pointed out before, kind of irrelevant anyway, because their name was actually the Haudenosaunee. So uh, those five tribes in that league, later uh, a sixth tribe joined, uh, had this very good relationship with the Dutch. And the Dutch, who uh, were wanting to get uh, furs, mostly from the Iroquois, or Iroquois, or Otanasone, um, traded in return, traded them guns and ammunition. The um, neighboring areas, uh, the neighboring tribes outside New England that were the rivals of the uh, Iroquois, mostly were Algonquin tribes, and they mostly traded and made alliances with the French. Uh, the big difference between having an alliance with the Dutch and having an alliance with the French at that early point was the French did not trade guns to their Indian allies. They thought it was a bad idea. So the Algonquin tribes didn't have guns and the Iroquois had guns. You want to guess how that turned out? Well, uh, during this period, basically a uh, period of the entire 17th century, a series of wars among various uh, native nations known as the Beaver Wars, in which the, uh, the Iroquois pretty well came out on top. And you can see here in this map, the magenta uh, colored area there in New York State presently, that's the traditional homeland of the Iroquois. And you can see how over the course of the 1600s, they expanded farther and farther westward and to the south and southwestward so that uh, modern-day 
Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, down into modern day Kentucky and even uh, uh, part of Middle Tennessee, uh, all were eventually controlled by the Iroquois. And again, that's because they had the guns. Uh, eventually, the French caught on that that wasn't such a good idea and started giving their allies guns, but it was a little too late by then. Now, 1664, the English took over New Amsterdam, renamed it New York, and they also took over the Dutch trade obligation with the Iroquois League. So they just uh, replaced the Dutch there. Same deal as before. So the English were giving guns to the Iroquois. Um, as, uh, as you can see, there's all this expansion on the part of the Iroquois, but the Iroquois were not settler colonists. They took over this territory but not because they wanted to live there. That's what England was doing, right? England was taking over various territories so that they could send, well, basically their excess poor people there. Um, the Iroquois didn't want to live in Ohio. They wanted to control Ohio. They wanted to control the fur trade so that they would have a virtual monopoly with the Dutch and, and the English and any other European powers and uh, so instead of moving in, they chased away the people who already lived there uh, so that they would do their, uh, their fur trapping and hunting all through the uh, area that today is the, uh, basically the Midwest. And as they did that, the tribes who were already there, they were pushed away, either pushed westward like the Lakota, the Lakota Sioux, who were chased westward out onto the plains, or they were chased southward, like, for example, the Shawnee of Ohio, who were forced southward down into uh, Kentucky and into Tennessee and, and Georgia, eventually. And that kind of uh, uh, sets the stage for what's going to happen next in the southern colonies on the southern frontier. Okay, so here uh, on this map, you can see uh, circled there the Erie tribe there in um, northern Ohio. They were pushed southward by the, uh, by the Iro Iroquois. Now, like I said, initially the Algonquin tribes that were allied with the French didn't have guns. Later they got guns, but it was too late. So the Erie, by the time they were chased out of their homeland, had some guns, and also they'd been fighting the uh, Iroquois for a long time, and they had taken some of their guns. Point is, they head south, and kind of the same thing happens when the, uh, uh, this particular branch of the Erie tribe gets down, uh, they travel through Virginia and down into South Carolina, they wind up being the only tribe with guns. They basically move in and there goes the neighborhood. Now this branch became known as the Westo tribe. Again, not native to South Carolina. In fact, they had just gotten there in the mid 1600s. First, they show up in Virginia in 1654 where they were trading captives for guns. Uh, so captives they had taken from other tribes that they were uh, essentially selling to the English colonists in Virginia in return for more guns. Then they go farther south to South Carolina, and now uh, they've got all these guns. They immediately start attacking the local tribes there and raiding them for captives to sell, to sell as slaves. And again, they've got the guns, so they have a big advantage. 1674, the Westo made a trade agreement with the, uh, the royal governor, colonial governor of South Carolina, Henry Woodward, in which uh, he basically gave them a, a monopoly on the slave trade. And we're not talking about the African slave trade, we're talking about the Indian slave trade, which had become a big thing in the South. It had really started, uh, as we discussed earlier, in Massachusetts there with the... Uh, 
massacre at Mystic River. But by the late 1600s, um, with the tobacco uh, agriculture and indigo, and uh, by this point in South Carolina, rice plantations, uh, they were using Native American slaves that they were buying from other Native Americans uh, who had captured them in battle. All right, well, the West O, they've got the, uh, they've got the monopoly, and by golly, they use it. They start raiding everywhere. Uh, here, here they are in South Carolina, and as you can see, South Carolina being the southernmost of the North American colonies, not counting the Caribbean colonies. So the, the frontier for those English colonists in the south, the frontier was Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, and Kentucky. Well, the West, though, are raiding all through the Carolinas into Georgia, as far as Alabama, down into northern Florida even, and they are just attacking all the tribes uh, which don't have guns, uh, except for maybe a few individuals. And they really just completely disrupt society in the area to the point that within just a few years, by 1680, the royal government of South Carolina was regretting having made this deal with the Westos. They wanted a steady supply of slaves but they didn't want all the slaves. They didn't want all the Indians in the entire South to be slaves because somebody had to be there for them to trade with to get the various things they wanted, including uh, the furs uh, in the South. It was, uh, it was actually deerskin, not, not beaver. Um, and they also wanted some tribes there that they could have as allies as a buffer against the Spanish in Florida. So the Westos are killing everybody. Uh, they're just going nuts. Uh, that's... Uh, um, what you would call an entrepreneurial spirit. They were true capitalists. Pretty quickly developed into that. Well, um, the, the colonial government regretted that deal. They stopped trading guns to them, but too late. They already had a bunch of guns. Uh, so the govern, government of South Carolina turned to another group of Indians, another tribe, to make their official slave suppliers, and it was another tribe, just like the, the Westo, who had been chased out of Ohio by the, uh, the Iroquois. It was the Shawnee, um, whose name for themselves is Shawano, and sometimes was uh, pronounced by the English, English Shavano, from which you got Savannah, Savannah, the Savannah River. South Carolina. It's the river that actually divides South Carolina and Georgia. So there's a branch of the Shawnee there um, and the South Carolina government gives them all the guns having regretted what they had done with the Westo. Uh, and uh, so the, uh, the Shawnee, who had been raided by the Westo before this, um, they get their revenge and they start raiding the Westo to the point that they were virtually exterminated. Uh, there were really no Westo left, a handful of individuals who were absorbed by other tribes. Now, South Carolina learned from their earlier mistake of just giving guns to one group, which then kind of went wild with the, their efforts to get a monopoly. So they also dealt with another tribe in Alabama, South Carolina, the Yamasee tribe. Uh, they had been chased out by the Westos, but now Westos are gone, so they come back and become allies of the South Carolina government and become, along with the Shawnee, the principal slave suppliers for the South Carolina colony. And South Carolina needed a lot of slaves. Um, they were not planting tobacco there. That's what uh, the plantations had been in Virginia and Maryland and the northern part of Carolina, which became, spoiler alert, North Carolina. Uh, but in South Carolina, they were growing rice. And a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the plantation owners in South Carolina were a different kind of people than those people who had come to Virginia from England. Now, they were English, 
but they didn't come directly from England. They tended to be the second and third sons of English owners of plantations in the Caribbean in places like Barbados and the Bahamas and later Jamaica. And in those areas, uh, slavery was particularly harsh, much harsher than in North America um, because the growing season was year round. And so they could just work people and never give them a break at all. And they figured out that it was cheaper to buy more African slaves than to keep the ones you've got alive. So just work them to death and just bring in more. And those are the people who moved into South Carolina and established these rice plantations, which require much more labor than tobacco, more land and more labor. So that's why there were so many slaves wanted in South Carolina. They had African slaves, but they also wanted lots of Native American slaves. Well, um, the Yamases uh, kind of follow the same pattern that the Westos had. They start raiding far and wide into, uh, they start raiding into uh, Florida, like I said, and you know the English didn't really care about that because Florida belonged to the Spanish, so more power to them. Uh, and they virtually wiped out several tribes in northern Florida uh, to the extent uh, that uh, there was a danger of war between Spain and England over that. Um, however, eventually uh, there's going to be a, a huge change, a huge turnaround in that region that's going to involve the Yamases that is going to set the frontier on fire. 